It's time for the Biblical Prophecy Program with your host, Alan Kirshner of Eschatoz Ministries. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Biblical Prophecy Program. So I had a great time at the the Pre-Wrath Conference last Saturday, a few days ago, in Egan, Minnesota, uh, with Ryan Habana. Uh, we had a good crowd and just great fellowship, uh, great teaching, and in fact, uh, I will have the audio up on the e-store uh Lord willing, by the end of the week. So once I do, I'll make an announcement, and uh, so you guys would be able to have some audio for the conference. Uh, the conference was the the theme of the conference was understanding the book of Revelation. the The sessions were very logical sessions. We really covered a lot on at least up front on the structure of the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm telling you, so many prophecy students uh, get the structure of the book of Revelation wrong. And if you don't have the structure right, uh, then, you know, that's, you can have all sorts of different frameworks. Um, of course, that begs the question, right? Uh, why do I think my structure, my understanding of the structure of the book of Revelation is correct? Well, that's, uh, I gave some of those reasons in the conference. And I also talked about the uh, the millennial issue and the main millennial text in the Bible, Revelation, uh, not Revelation 20, as mo- a vast majority of people say, but no, the context of the millennium begins in Revelation, not Revelation 20, but Revelation 19, verse 11. Uh, so I had a whole session on that. And then Ryan gave some great sessions on the seals, Revelation 6, 7, Trump, uh, and, and trumpet judgments and whatnot. And he also uh, gave the fourth session on the nature and purpose of the millennium. So it was a great conference. I mean, even though it was four sessions, right? And there's a Q&A session as well. Unfortunately, the, the, the Q&A was not uh, recorded uh, because we only had like one laugh uh, mic and it would have been kind of awkward going back and forth with a lav mic. Uh, so we, but we we re- recorded the four sessions, and these are really substantive sessions. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, in fact, I would I would probably challenge anybody to find a uh, a prophecy Bible prophecy conference that actually is more exegetical in substance than what occurred on Saturday. So if you like substance and not merely and not sensationalism, uh, if you enjoy uh, the exegetical process and really getting into the meat of Scripture, then this conference uh, was for you. And again, um, we we recorded it, not video re- recorded it, but we uh, did audio record. Uh, but we also will have the the notes as well, the notes of the conference. Okay, so in speaking of the millennium, uh, I, I've, I've addressed this question before, this issue before, previously um, in the in the past. But I think it's really important, and I and I need to discuss it again. And that is, you know, why premillennial theology matters. That it's not some merely academic exercise. Premillennialism teaches that at Jesus' is coming, he's going to deliver the righteous and judge the ungodly. Then the righteous will enter into a period, the millennium, of peace and righteousness, where Jesus will establish on earth his physical reign of all the nations, including a, a restored nation of Israel who recognizes him as the Messiah. All nations are going to worship Jesus as King and Lord. Uh, The future millennium will be characterized socially, politically, ethnically, and spiritually. So, 
and 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 again, this is I'm just giving a preface here before I I get into my uh, I'll, I'll give four reasons four reasons why pre uh, premillennial theology matters. Uh, but I I want to note though that. The narrative, when, when you discuss the uh, millennial issue, you have to believe, begin in not Revelation 20, verse 1. That's like you're diving right in the middle of the context, and all millennialists do this all the time. You have got to give pushback. Every time you hear an all millennialist begin to try to defend all millennialism, and they begin, of course, you're going to begin at Revelation 20, verse 1, uh, you got to say, stop. Stop. <laughs> You're diving right into the middle of the context. You, you need to back up to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. So, <clears throat> because, the, the, I mean, the, the narrative context, it, there's, a, there's a cause and effect action where the victory of Jesus at the battle of Armageddon will cause the defeat of the three, not just two, but the three enemies of God, the beast, the, i.e. the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. The passage states that Satan's immediate punishment will be his binding in the abyss for 1,000 years. That is the millennium. So in, in short, because Jesus' battle victory occurs during the future second coming, the binding of Satan must begin at the second coming. So the millennial debate is... It's not about you know how long or whether the thousand years are literal or not. I, I believe they are literal, but that's not the millennial debate. The millennial debate is when does the binding of Satan begin? And the context, the con- this is why all millennialists don't want to go to Revelation 19, because they know that, well, if you begin in Re- Revelation 19, well, what, what's Revelation 19 depicting? It, it's depicting uh, an event in, at the second coming of Christ, at the future second coming of Christ. And that's sort of, you know, is problematic for the all-millennial position because they want to retroject Satan's binding back to the first coming of Christ. But if you put the context at the second coming of Christ, where it should be, that is, the reason why Satan is bound, at what point is he bound? He's bound as a result, a consequence of the battle victory of Jesus in Revelation 19, then the millennial binding of Satan must occur at the second coming of Christ. Hence, premillennialism. Four reasons. Four reasons why I think premillennialism, premillennial theology is important and why it matters. And those, you know, whether it's a pastor or someone in the church or maybe a teacher, a professor, a scholar, you know, a lot of them are going to poo-poo even discussing this issue. It doesn't really matter. Pan at millennialism. You know, it's all going to pan out at the end. It doesn't really matter. Let's not, you know, let's let's divert our energies to something else. Well, when I hear people say that, you know, I I I I really I really believe that they're not actually thinking through the implications of this theology. It's very surface level view that they have of what Jesus revealed. In Revelation, I believe it undermines the authority of Scripture. Okay, number one, first, Satan is not bound during the church age, as all millennialism would have it. But right now, he is he is roaring. He is he, he is like a roaring lion, right? As Peter says, on the prowl looking for someone to devour. And so, uh, premillennialism, of course, all millennialists would agree. They would agree that that he's roaring as a lion. Uh, so what they have to do, they have to they have to redefine the the meaning of Satan binding. So they have a very strict meaning uh, when they talk about the binding of Satan. But when you read Revelation twenty, <laughs> um, it's like, well, how could John stress more of the absolute binding of Satan of all of his activities, not just one little activity? Right, but all of his activities, uh, the 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 binding of Satan and all the processes that you see, you know, being thrown, being bound, uh, and being the, the the abyss being sealed. So anyway, so so number one, premillennialism takes takes seriously the spiritual battle that the Bible portrays within the spirit world, right? Especially as it will escalate just before Christ returns. 
Uh, we're not, you know, we're not living in a blessed millennial age. I'm sorry, I'm millennialist. We're not. Uh, we're living in a very wicked age where injustice, immorality, and no fear of God dominates the world. It says Satan, Satan is, uh, Satan's the, uh, the, you know, he's the God of this world. Uh, he is, uh, th- this is his kingdom right now. His kingdom right now is this world. He's not bound. So what, but we, you know, we long as Christians, we long for the day when our righteous king returns to defeat his enemies and quote, as Psalm, as Psalm says in uh, Psalm 2, 9, you will break them with an iron scepter and smash them like a potter's jar. Okay, number two. So, so first of all, the first reason is that I believe that premillennialism makes much better sense of the spiritual warfare of what's going on right now uh, than all millennialism. Number two, the second reason why premillennial theology matters is that it takes in consideration the complex nature of God's dealings with his people. Uh, all millennialism, on the other hand, views the return of Christ as an as just a, a simple event, monochromatically. You know, there's no no emphasis on the events leading up to the return of Jesus. Uh, their their schema is that you know the return of Christ is this amorphous notion that well Christ will return and in one single day everything's going to happen and and you know everything's going to be uh, you know suddenly ushered into the eternal state. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible depicts. Rather, the uh, premillennial view rightly views a complex, comprehensive whole in which God will fulfill his redemptive purposes through stages. Through stages, just like he's always done since day one. Why would, you know, if you look at, you know, why was there... The, the the phase of the patriarchic stage of God's redemptive stage, or before that, or after, during uh, the the nation of Israel, or the Jesus's ministry, or the Church Age, you know, why do we? Ha- why why does God has God chosen these complex stages of His redemptive history, and why why would it be any different? Why would it be any different in the future when Jesus returns? Listen. God is, Christ is going to be glorified. Christ is going to be glorified when he comes back. It's not going to be some, you know, quick, uh, you know, simple event, one second, and it's all done, and we're ushered in. No, I'm sorry. Jesus is going to be glorified, and there's going to be a lot of things he's going to be doing. Lots of things he's going to be doing. The, even the, 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 the day of the Lord's judgments are going to be complex, just like the uh, the, the the plagues of Egypt, they weren't like, you know, snap your finger. Oh, it's all done. No, it, it took time. He's, God was being glorified through these judgments. Likewise, when Jesus returns, God's people is going to be delivered and he's going to mete out systematic judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bow judgments, Armageddon, and so forth. So... <clears throat> You know, there's going to be, the, and again, the, the, then you're going to have the Antichrist Great Tribulation, right? The eschatological suffering of the church. I'm saying that to my pre-trib brothers and sisters who want to, you know, escape from a, a future persecution just before Jesus' return. As if, you know, you know why, why would the church be exempt from suffering just before Jesus' return? It's never been exempt from suffering ever before. That makes no sense. And it doesn't make biblical sense either. So, and then you got the complex event of Israel's salvation, the resurrection, rapture, day of the Lord's rapture. It, it's they're, they're complex series of events. And then you got the new heavens, new earth, uh, millennial issues, all the material aspects, political, ethnic, social aspects of the millennium, and Satan's final defeat. So, premillennialism takes seriously the. The complex nature, it makes sense of the complex nature of what how it's, that scripture depicts. Okay, number three, premillennialism does not believe that the world will that the world will increasingly get better 
or Christianized before Christ returns, contra post millennialism. And Pat Robertson and Gary DeMar. You know, Jeff Durbin's teaching this post millennial theology where, you know, the world is going to get basically Christianized before Jesus returns. Um, nope, nope, that's, that's not how scripture depicts it. I'm sorry. You know, there are, again, the, uh, the, the post-millennial pastors are misleading God's people, teaching that, you know, God's going to, um, again, basically that, you know, uh, through, anyway, uh, well, you get my, my, um, my point here. No, premillennialism teaches instead that the Bible, the Bible reveals that the world is going to increasingly get more wicked before Christ returns, and that only Christ himself will usher in the age of righteousness. I mean, there's a reason why Jesus says, you know, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? It's rhetorical, and it's ominous as well. In other words, and by the way, that's, that's if you read Luke 17 and 18 there, it's in the context of eschatological suffering and persecution, in other words, the persecution is going to be so bad that many are going to apostatize. Many uh, professing Christians are going to apostatize because the persecution is going to be so great. In fact, Jesus says in his Olive Discourse that uh, it's going to be the worst time, unequaled period of persecution for, for believers. So, and you can read First Thessalonians chapter one. By the way, yeah, look at First Thessalonians. This is directed toward post millennialist. First Thessalonians chapter one. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter one. Mark thirteen. Luke seventeen. Twenty one. Matthew twenty four. Revelation. The old and then the Old Testament passages. Again, you know, here it's just too numerous to list here. Uh, and of course, you know, the the post millennialist. The way they try to get around this is, and it doesn't work. Uh, the way they get around it, try to say, "Well, oh, those passages, those aren't for the, fu- those are not describing the future. Those are describing, uh, you know, the, uh, the first century." So that that's how they get try to get around that. Number four, premillennialism. At least most of them. Sadly, I, I, you know, I should qualify that. I don't even know if most of them do. Maybe half of them. Maybe fewer than half. They affirm. We affirm the unconditional promises to national Israel. God is re- going to remain faithful to his promises to Israel. And all millennialism and post-millennialism denies a future reconstituted national Israel. And thus, they deny God's faithfulness to his promise to Israel, or at least to try to redefine it, but that doesn't work. So this is, this is important to the millennial debate because it relates one's fundamental approach to biblical interpretation. And it also it distorts their theology of the nature of the church and its role in God's redemptive purposes. So let me just recap. Number one, pre, pre, why does premillennial theology matter? Well, it takes seriously spiritual warfare. Number two, it considers the complex nature of God's dealings with his people just before Jesus returns. And number three, it recognizes that the world is going to increasingly get more wicked just before Jesus returns. And number four, it affirms God's faithfulness, his unconditional promises to national Israel. Okay, great. Uh, I hope that's been helpful uh, for you. And if you want to become an Eschatos partner and support the ministry uh, on a monthly basis, you can go to alankirshner.com and sign up there. Hey, thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye now.